a lot of attendees today and that's wonderful. I'm going to be talking about some general guidance for businesses that are getting ready to, to reopen um, or maybe are already open, have been opened and have to close earlier, but this is still I think good information for any business that's operating under these conditions. And then I'm also going to go over the new Virginia employment laws. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. While um, during the presentation, if you have questions, you'll note at the bottom of your screen, if you wiggle your mouse, the little toolbar will pop up. And one of the little icons for you there is um, show q and It looks like a couple of comment bubbles. And if you click on that, a um, screen on the right side of your screen will open up. And that's where you can post questions. At the end of the presentation, I will go over those questions. Um, but if you could just post them when they pop into your mind and then we can review them at the end. So this is just who I am. I'm, gonna, I'm a partner with Van Dievender Black. I focus my practice on labor and employment law. And this is primarily what I do in my practice is a lot of different labor and employment law issues, including FLSA, discrimination, FEMLA, all, all that stuff. You can go on to the next slide. So where are we right now in Virginia? Well, um, we never did have the same type of restrictions that we've seen in other states. Our, our state has been a little more lax than some of the states where the outbreak has been particularly bad. But the three main executive orders that affect um, most businesses in Virginia that you should all be aware of if you aren't already are 53, 55, and 61. 53 is the executive order that the governor signed that closed restaurants, gyms, entertainment venues, and um, similar types of businesses. It put some restrictions on non-essential retail businesses. They're basically allowed to operate with, but with certain restrictions. Most businesses, though, really didn't face a lot of restrictions under the Executive Order 53 um, outside of those specific categories. It does, however, ban gatherings of more than 10 people. The next big executive order was 55. That is set to expire on June 10th. That's what's commonly referred to as the stay at home order, but significantly it did allow travel for work, so it really didn't um, stop any businesses that weren't already stopped by executive 53 executive order 53 and then executive order 61 is the newest executive order that's relevant and this is the one that um what the governor is calling phase one where they're going to start easing certain restrictions very slowly and then we'll have subsequent phases if phase one goes well Currently, phase one is to go into effect this Friday, the 15th, and to remain in effect until June 10th. But of course, the governor could extend that or modify that. He announced yesterday that phase one will not begin in Northern Virginia until May 29th, and that's because Northern Virginia has had a much more severe outbreak than the rest of the state. Under this phase one, restaurants are allowed to operate, but only with their outdoor dining. They're still not allowed to have indoor dining. Um, and even with the outdoor dining, there's certain restrictions on how many um, customers they can have at any one time. Non-essential retail operations are allowed to continue, but they have to have masks. They're limited to occupancy of no more than 50% of the lowest occupancy load on their certificate of occupancy. Fitness and exercise businesses are still basically shut down. They're only allowed to have outside activities. Personal care, grooming services, um, you know, your hairdresser, they are allowed to operate, but with very strict restrictions. They can only have 50% um, of their lowest occupancy. They have to maintain social distancing. They have to wear masks. The clients have to wear masks and then there are other restrictions. So it's a very gradual release of some of the restrictions that were in place under Executive Order 53. You can go to the next slide. So as businesses are looking to reopen or even if you were already open and you weren't um, required to close previously, businesses are really dealing with several very different competing interests that are each very significant. The first, of course, is the need to protect your actual business, to keep the doors open, to keep the money flowing, to keep people employed, and to keep the business operating. Clearly, that's a very important consideration. At the same time, businesses have to struggle to do everything they can to protect their employees from getting sick. 
And then, of course, you also have to worry about third parties, your customers, your clients, vendors who are coming onto your premises, and are they potentially being exposed? So those are all concerns that businesses have to try to juggle in determining how to how to operate currently or how to resume operations if they had previously closed. You can go to the next slide. So at a minimum, every business should have, a, should have a coronavirus policy, and I'm going to discuss that a bit more. And also, if you have fewer than 500 employees, you do need to make sure that you have the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act paid leave poster, which is available from the Department of Labor. You have to have that posted and you have to distribute it to your employees. Um, if you are, if you do have any employees who are taking these paid leave categories, it's critical that you collect the documentation that is required in order to support that paid leave. If you fail to do that, your tax credit could be denied. So it's really important that you take care of that up front. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about coronavirus policy. I do recommend that every business have one. If you're operating at all right now, you really need to have a coronavirus policy. And this is going to be a living document. You're going to have to update it and revise it um, probably on a weekly basis. The CDC is constantly releasing new guidance. OSHA is releasing new guidance. And you need to go back and look at those things and address them in your policy. And then also you're going to need to tweak your policy depending on what's happening in your operations and as you discover different issues that you need to address. Um, the bullet points I have on this slide are kind of the minimum things you should have in your coronavirus policy. I really I recommend that you designate a single manager who's going to be your company's coronavirus coordinator. And that's important so that you have a consistent message to your employees and so that you have one person who's really tasked with staying on top of these developing guidelines and is taking care of that issue. You really need to have some an individual who's put in charge of that. Um, at a minimum, the policy should have the basics. It should direct the employees who are feeling ill, who are exhibiting, exhibiting symptoms, they need to stay away. You need to have a procedure for what you're going to do when an employee tests positive. How are you going to address that? You need to have a procedure for what you're going to do if an employee has been exposed to someone who tests positive. If one of your employees tells you, hey, my husband just tested positive, how is the company going to respond? And then it is important that you distribute your policy to your employees. That functions for a couple of reasons. One, it makes sure that the employees know what the rules are and that they're following the rules, but also it helps reassure the employees that you are doing what you can to keep them safe and so they can feel comfortable still coming to work and that they're going to be safe and that the company takes it seriously. You can go to the next slide. So how are you bringing employees back? If your business had previously furloughed employees or laid employees off, and you're now in the um, fortunate position to be able to increase business and bring some employees back, it's important that you make sure you have a non-discriminatory method to how you're recalling employees so that you would avoid, avoid a discrimination claim later that someone got preferential treatment and how you were recalling. So come up with some non-discriminatory method it, obviously business reasons have to go first and it could be that you just need employees who perform a particular task and those are the ones that get to come back first that's fine but within employee within the group of employees who perform the same task how are you selecting people seniority is a great non-discriminatory method to choose um, but you have to pick what works for your business you just want to make sure that there wouldn't be any allegation that you are favoring employees of one race or favoring employees of one gender over the other um, Another thing to consider is, and this would not be required, but it's just a consideration, having some type of questionnaire for returning employees. And this would be designed to make sure you're not bringing back someone who is potentially infected. So the questionnaire would go over things like, have you been exposed within the last 14 days to someone that you know has tested positive? Have you been to a, um, have you traveled to an area that has a known outbreak or a hotspot of coronavirus? have you had symptoms lately or have you yourself tested positive? Another thing to consider, and a lot of businesses are doing this now, the EEOC has stated that this is legal, is to perform some type of daily health screen before people come into the office or into your workplace. And that could be asking questions about how are you feeling? Are you exhibiting symptoms? Also, 
you could take the employee's temperature if you'd like to. So a lot of businesses are doing that now. The temperature guns are um, selling like hotcakes, and we're seeing that more and more. The CDC um, has allowed that. The EEOC has said it is legal to do that. Um, there are some people who criticize it as being ineffective because there's also a lot of evidence that people can have coronavirus and be contagious and not have a temperature. There are also some people who are concerned that if you have those type of, types of requirements placed on people entering your workplace, people who make it past that point may feel that they're safe and they don't have to observe all the other guidelines because everybody who got past doesn't have a temperature so we can high five and hug and everything. So you want to make sure that if you do have those screening um, requirements in place that you make sure employees are still following the other social distancing rules. Now, if you are going to have those types of screening measures like temperature taking and daily questionnaires for your employees before they enter the workplace, give some attention to the potential FLSA issue. It is entirely unclear because this is a, an unprecedented situation. We do not know whether a court would require that the time an employee spends in line or a time the time the employee spends going through these screenings, whether that would be considered compensable time under the Fair Labor Standards Act. There are some, um, you can interpret the case law either way. And I think that this is going to be a potential risk for employers that we're probably gonna see some litigation regarding this issue in the coming months or coming years whether or not employers have to pay employees for that time spent in line. If you're going to be doing temperature screening or other types of um, health screening before the employee clocks in, give some thought as to whether you want to compensate the employee for that time, have it be on the clock so that you can avoid any type of litigation over that issue in the future. Again, it's unclear whether that's required, but that might be the safer thing to do just to avoid the fight. If you don't want to do that, certainly take steps to minimize the time that the employees are spending in line. And you can do that by staggering work shifts, staggering reporting times, or taking other steps or having multiple screening stations. But think of ways you can minimize the time that they're spending in line so that you can minimize your liability. One question I've been getting a lot lately, and I'm sure other attorneys have as well, is what do we do with an employee who simply refuses to return to work? And the answer is, it depends on what his reasons are for refusing to, to return to work. An employee who just much prefers the unemployment checks, which are um, quite juicy right now, has no legal protection. Or an employee who is just afraid to come into work has no legal protection. You can require your employee to show up to work, and if he fails to do so, you can terminate his employment. The um, Small Business Administration has released some guidance regarding businesses that have taken the PPP loan, and they've said that loan forgiveness will not be reduced if the borrower laid off an employee, offered to rehire the same employee, but the employee declined the offer. Um, and they point out that obviously the employee will lose unemployment eligibility um, in that case. But what you have to do to take advantage of that is you have to have a written offer of reemployment that includes the same wages that the employee had before and the same hours that the employee had before. And then you need to document the employee's um, rejection of that offer. And the way to do that would be to include in the written offer of rehire a statement that we need to hear back from you by and give a deadline and say, if we don't hear back from you by that date, we will assume you are rejecting this reemployment offer. And that will help you establish that you did make the offer. Um, so another thing to consider is if the employee tells you he can't come back to work because of a medical condition or because of a psychological condition. He may have some protection under either the Americans with Disabilities Act or under FEMLA, the Families and Family and Medical Leave Act. So if the employee raises that as the excuse for not returning to work, ask some more questions, ask for medical documentation so that you can determine whether or not they have some legal right to stay out. But otherwise, as I said, you can just simply terminate their employment. Go on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to go over a few tips and options that you can take in your workplace to try to reduce the risk of enforcement. Not all these are work, will work for all businesses, but these are just some things to take into consideration and some ideas for you. Certainly, every business should be taking a look, as I mentioned, at the CDC guidelines and the OSHA guidelines. These are changing um, 
pretty frequently. The CDC seems to be posting something new almost every week. So you want to check those frequently. And as I mentioned, that's going to cause you to revise your coronavirus policy. But that's something you always want to check on. Apart from that, of course, you do want to maintain social distancing. Take a look at the physical layout of your business. How can you change where employees work, their actual physical workstations, in order to maximize the distance between um, them? You might need to put up physical barriers like plexiglass, depending on what their work is. Another idea is to stagger work shifts. As I mentioned, that could help reduce the conge congestion at uh, temperature screening stations. It can also help reduce the um, risk of infection because it would reduce the number of people who are working together and it would help you with contact tracing if there is an outbreak at your office. Um, some ways to do that would be to have actual different work shifts. You know, one, one group works eight to four and the other group works four to 10. You know, that's just an idea. You can also divide your employees into teams um, and have one group you know, have an A team and a B team. A team works for two weeks, and then you have a day where the plant is closed and you disinfect everything, and then B team works the following two weeks, and then A team comes back. That's just another, another idea. You might want to look into creating work pods or bubbles, and what I mean by that is grouping your employees into a little work group and limiting their contact to only the other people in that group so that if there is an, um, someone in the workplace who has coronavirus, you are limited to the number of people who would have been potentially infected. Look at restricting visitors. Certainly non-work related visits should probably be eliminated for most businesses. You might need to limit the number of customers who are present. Always take into consideration what positions can be performed by telework and take advantage of that to the extent you can. That also has the advantage not only of reducing your infection rate, but of allowing your business to continue in the event you have to close the office because of an outbreak. You can go to the next slide, please. Of course, masks are um, something that you're, we're seeing more of. It may not be required for your business, but you may still want to use those to help, if nothing else, make the employees feel safer, but it also may also help reduce the risk of infection. You want to encourage hand washing. You want to provide hand sanitizers where employees might be away from a bathroom where they can wash their hands. You want to restrict travel to the extent that you can for your business. Restrict employees' movements within the office. One idea a lot of businesses are using now is to put tape on the floor, directing um, traffic, foot traffic where employees should walk, dividing corridors into one-way hallways to try to restrict um, close contact between people, limiting employees' access to certain rooms, keeping doors closed if employees have have an individual office, keeping them in their office with their door shut and limiting the amount of time that they're coming out and interacting with other people. Restrict equipment sharing. If they do have to share equipment, you certainly want to sanitize or clean it between uses. Um, eliminate congregation points in an office, candy dishes, break rooms, coffee stations, water coolers, other places in your office that might encourage people to cluster around. You want to get rid of those to the extent that you can. Encourage your employees to bring their own lunch and to eat separately. Um, that might not be as much fun, but it will help reduce the risk of infection. You go to the next slide, please. Limit in-person meetings. Use video conferencing as much as possible, even when everyone is in the office. You can have everyone in their separate office with their doors closed meeting on Zoom or meeting on Teams or whatever system your company uses. Whatever disinfection procedures you have, document them and also maintain documentation that those procedures are being followed. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you want to plan how you're going to respond if an employee tests positive. If you follow some of these procedures and you've limited the number of people your employees are coming into contact with, that will greatly facilitate contact tracing. In addition, you're going to want to interview the employee who has tested positive to the extent that you can and ask him or her who they came in contact with and also speak with their manager. Who do they come in contact with? And then you're going to need to notify those employees who have been exposed. But of course, you have to maintain the privacy of the individual who tested positive. 
at times this can seem almost absurd because everyone you speak to will know you're talking about Joe. Joe's the only one not here today. Joe said he had a really bad fever yesterday when he went home, so we know you're talking about Joe. Yes, they've figured it out, but you're not going to confirm it, and at no point will you tell the employees it's Joe. So you do have to maintain the employee's privacy unless the employee consents to you using his name, but you would want to put, get that in writing. Above all, you're going to need to be prepared to either halt your operations or go remote. Depending on where the individual who tested positive has been in your building, you may need to close parts of your building or you may need to close the whole thing if the employee had wide access to the building. And again, that's another reason to restrict the employee's movements within the building. Go to the next slide, please. Of course, there are a number of unknown risks that right now we can't really figure out what business's exposure is. The, the big thing that I have a lot of concern about is workers' compensation. Up until recently, we could have said with confidence that ordinary diseases generally are not going to be held compensable for under workers' compensation. And that reason for that was that, generally speaking, it's pretty much impossible for your employee to show that he caught it at work. That may be changing now, and we don't have any actual guidance from the Virginia Workers' Compensation Commission on this yet. And we don't have any cases on this yet. But it is possible, given the stay-at-home order and the steps a number of individuals are taking to limit their exposure to other people, it is possible that an employee may be able to prove that they got it at your office. Certainly, if there was an outbreak at your office and the employee could prove that he was complying with the stay-at-home order and the only place he ever went was to work, it's going to be a lot easier for him to prove that work was where he caught coronavirus. So. At this point, we don't have that, but that's something I think we should all keep our eyes on. We also don't know what's going to happen with regard to third party liability. And I mean, your customers or your vendors, what if they claim they caught coronavirus at your business? What is your potential exposure there? And at this point, that's still a big question mark. As I'm sure you've seen in the news, Congress has been discussing creating some type of immunity for businesses to address these, this very issue about third party liability. It hasn't happened yet. I know yesterday there was um, there was some talk about how we would first have to have some real rules about what steps employers should take to minimize the risk at work, and if an employee and an employer would have to actually follow those guidelines before they would have immunity. But right now, that's just talk. We don't have anything actually from Congress. And then I bring up the case of Wando Evans just as a cautionary tale. This is a case out of Illinois, and Wando Evans caught coronavirus at work. He was a Walmart employee. There were few people at this Walmart store who had, um, a few employees at this Walmart store who had coronavirus. He caught it and he died. And his estate has brought a lawsuit against Walmart. It's unclear to me why that wouldn't be a workers' comp issue, but maybe the workers' comp bar is just different in the state of Illinois. But anyway, I thought this was an interesting case just because the allegations that have been made in the case, and it's recently filed, so we don't know what's going to happen with it, whether it's going to be dismissed or how it's going to turn out. But the list of allegations I thought is good for employers just to see, um, just so you can know the types of things you need to be aware of. So what Wando Evans' estate alleges is that Walmart would violate the duty of care and was negligent and that they were failing to cleanse and sterilize the store. They failed to enforce social distancing. They didn't provide personal protective equipment. They didn't warn Mr. Evans or other employees that there were people at work who had symptoms and they weren't following the CDC and OSHA guidelines. So those are just some things that you gotta keep in mind. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay, now I'm gonna get into the massive change that we've seen in Virginia employment law. And this is absolutely, um, stunning for a number of reasons. Typically, Virginia employment law up until this point has been very minimal, and Virginia employers really only had to worry about federal law. We didn't, we didn't have very many Virginia employment laws of our own, and that made this a very employer-friendly state. You can go to the next slide, please. But now we have become a lot more like California. And it is not a lovely place, unfortunately. This is not going to be good for businesses 
overall, these laws are going to be extremely plaintiff friendly, extremely employee friendly. You can go to the next slide, please. So the the most the easiest one to understand is just that the minimum wage is going up, and because of the current economic crisis, the governor has delayed the um, start date for this until May of next year. But in May of next year, the minimum wage goes up to $9.50 an hour. Virginia has not had its own minimum wage before. We've always just followed the federal minimum wage, but now we do. So beginning in next May, it's gonna be $9.50 an hour. Then the year after, it'll go up to $11 an hour. The year after that, $12 an hour. And then the law requires a quote, pause and study where they're basically gonna look at the economic impacts in regional markets. And then they will vote on whether to increase it again and then it will if they vote for it, it'll go up to 1350 in 2025 and then $15 an hour in 2026. The way it looks right now, that's likely to occur. But of course, that's far enough in the future that it's possible the General Assembly's composition could change and things could be different. Um, this does apply to home care providers. It applies to cleaners. Um, if you haven't already done so, you do need to start budgeting for this because it's probably going to affect your bottom line if you currently have minimum wage employees. You can go to the next slide, please. Non-payment of wages. This is a very significant change to Virginia law. Basically, it's creating a, um, a, a new source of income for plaintiff's attorneys. This law goes into effect on July 1 of this year and it creates a private cause of action for the failure to pay employees. It, the employee can bring this cause of action individually, jointly, or on behalf of similarly situated employees as a collective action. So we now have a collective action procedure under Virginia law that's very similar to the FLSA collective action procedure, which will allow your employees to um, any of your employees can file a lawsuit, say that he's filing it on behalf of himself and others similarly situated. Doesn't matter that he actually, actually talked to anyone else in his workplace yet. He files the suit and then other employees get to opt in and then you have a collective action. And this can be extremely expensive for the business and this would be to recover um, unpaid wages. The employee can recover the wages owed plus liquidated damages, which are equal to the wages owed plus interest, plus attorney's fees and costs. And if the violation was knowing, and knowingly, the employer knowingly failed to pay, then the employee can also recover treble damages. That's triple the amount of wages due and attorney's fees and costs. So this is a tremendous amount of money um, that employers could be forced to pay. I can't imagine that um, we will see any of these suits that don't allege a knowing failure to pay because of that um, potential for recovery there. In addition to the private cause of action, the commissioner, that's the commissioner, the Virginia commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry can also make civil penalty assessments against employers of up to $1,000 for each violation. They're gonna take into consideration the size of the business and the gravity of the violation and setting the penalty. And that's that's going to be an administrative procedure where you will get a letter from the commissioner saying you failed to pay wages owed. You will have only 15 days to challenge that assessment and then the commissioner's decision will be final and you'll have to pay that penalty plus the back wages. That though is going to be a lesser threat to your business than the private cause of action that I just discussed. You can go to the next slide please. So the statute defines knowing or knowingly as when the business had actual knowledge of the information, when the business acts in deliberate ignorance of the truth or falsity of the information, when the business acts in reckless disregard to the truth or falsity of the information, there's no specific intent to defraud required. So this is a very broad definition of knowing, and I am certain that, as I mentioned, all the lawsuits are going to include this allegation, and I don't think it's a very high hurdle for the employee to prove knowing um, a knowing violation. So we're going to see probably a lot of cases with these trouble damages. In addition to the civil liability, there can be criminal penalties, um, which can be up to $10,000 or more than $10,000 if it's a class six felony. Interestingly, the commissioner has the authority under this new law to investigate a business for failing to pay wages properly. 
And the commissioner can also bring an action against the employer for failing to pay wages, even if no employee consents to the suit. So the commissioner can just go off on his own. He doesn't have to have an employee ask the commissioner to do this. If the commissioner does file a suit against the employer, the commissioner can re, um, also recoup attorney's fees equal to one third of the award amount. So we can go to the next slide. So another new cause of action for um, employees to take against their employers is worker misclassification. And this goes into effect on January 1. <clears throat> In the recent recent couple of years, the Virginia state government has been really focused on this whole issue of worker misclassification. And this is when in a business has someone that they term an independent contractor, they don't withhold payroll taxes, they issue a 1099 and they treat the person as a non-employee. The governor and the, um, the state government in Virginia have been really concerned that they're missing out on a lot of tax dollars because of that, a lot of tax revenue because you're not withholding payroll taxes. As a result, the General Assembly has passed this law that creates a presumption that anyone that performs services for your business for remuneration, meaning they get paid for it, is an employee. There is a presumption that anyone who works for your business is an employee you're going to have to prove otherwise. And to do so, you're going to have to have facts under the IRS's test for independent contractor status. And you can find that um, on the IRS's website. They have a multi-factor test for whether or not someone is an employee or an independent contractor. As with all multi-factor tests, it is rarely clear whether someone is or is not an independent contractor. Many times when you when you look at those tests, depending on the facts of your situation, you're going to find some factors weigh in favor of making the person an employee and some facts weigh in against making the person an employee and keeping him as an independent contractor. So there are going to be some very difficult decisions for employers to make. But the thing to keep in mind is because of this presumption that the General Assembly has created that your worker is an employee, it's going to be a very difficult burden for you to overcome if you have factors that are pointing toward an employee and you're arguing that someone is an independent contractor. Violations of this um, misclassification law can result if you're a, uh, a contractor, you can be debarred from public contracting with the state of Virginia. But most significantly, it creates a private cause of action for the worker. The worker believes he's been misclassified as an independent contractor and should have been an employee. He can sue to recover his wages that he should have been paid as an employee. So that would include overtime, for example. If you had him classified as an independent contractor, you probably weren't tracking his hours. He may have been working more than 40 hours a week, and he probably will allege he was working more than 40 hours a week, and he will try to recover um, overtime compensation. He may have some other wage um, wages due that he's arguing for. Plus, he'll be able to recover any employment benefits you should have provided him. So that would be employment benefits you provide to your other employees, such as paid leave. He could get a cash equivalent of that. He can also recover any expenses that would have been covered by insurance. So if you provide your other employees with health insurance, dental insurance, vision insurance, and this worker had health care expenses or dental expenses or vision expenses, and those would have been covered by insurance had you classified him as an employee and offered him those benefits, you will have to pay for those expenses he incurred. You're going to have to pay his doctor's bills. And you can imagine that could be pretty ter ter um, terrible for a business if, for example, this worker had cancer or some other major medical issue during the period that he alleges he should have been an employee and should have been receiving your benefits and the business would then be on the hook for all those medical bills. In addition, the employee in this lawsuit can recover attorney's fees, costs, and workers' comp. The employee would now be eligible for workers' comp. There are also civil penalties, and that would be $1,000 for the first offense, that's per individual that was misclassified, $2,500 for the second offense, and $5,000 for subsequent offenses. It's not unusual for a business that has misclassified one individual as an independent contractor to have misclassified multiple individuals. So we could see those civil penalties rack up very quickly. 
And of course, the law also prohibits retaliation, which you would expect. Um, I can see this being a very expensive prospect for businesses and the issue of whether someone could be an independent contractor or employee has always been kind of sticky and a tricky issue to navigate because as I mentioned, often the factors go in both directions. But given this law, the risks for the employer in misclassifying someone have become substantially greater and the costs for getting this wrong have become substantially greater. It's critical that in businesses take a look right now at anyone that they have classified as an independent contractor and confirm that they really should be independent contractors. And if you're not sure, I would recommend that you go with the employee status because the risks are so much lower. There's no risk for that. Um, whereas if you get this wrong, you're going to end up paying a lot of money. And even if you don't have it wrong, ultimately having to litigate this is going to be very expensive for businesses. So this is something that you really need to take a look at now. You can go to the next slide, please. Non-compete agreements. These have also always been pretty difficult in Virginia because Virginia courts are generally reluctant to enforce non-compete agreements and they will often look for any excuse to throw the agreement out. Notoriously, Virginia does not allow what they call blue penciling. And what that means is that if a Virginia court feels that one aspect of a non-compete agreement is overly broad, the Virginia court will simply refuse to enforce the agreement as a whole. They won't modify that one overly broad as aspect. Because of that, non-compete agreements have been very difficult for employers, but a lot of businesses do have non-compete agreements because of the necessity to protect the business interests. This new law goes into effect on July 1 and it basically bans non-compete agreements for anyone who's what who is what they've classified as a low wage employee and that means anyone who is making less than the average weekly wage in the commonwealth on july 1st 2020 that's going to be anyone who's making less than 20 dollars and 30 cents an hour or less than one thousand one hundred thirty seven dollars per week or fifty nine thousand one hundred twenty four thousand i'm sorry $59,124 annually. So that definition of low wage employee, I think it's going to be surprising to a lot of businesses to think that someone making less than 59,000 is low wage. You know, someone making in the mid fifties is a low wage earner. But under this new law, you cannot enter into a non-compete agreement with a low wage employee. You cannot enforce or even threaten to enforce a non-compete agreement with a low wage earner. So if you have existing non-compete agreements, you don't necessarily have to do anything with those agreements, but know that you cannot try to enforce them or threaten to enforce them after July 1. This prohibition includes non-compete agreements with interns, students, apprentices, trainees, and independent contractors. It does not prohibit non-disclosure agreements. So you can still have a non-disclosure agreement which would prohibit the employee from sharing your confidential information. Also, non-solicitation agreements may be permissible, but you wanna take a close look at them to make sure that they fit within the narrow confines of this act. And that would basically be that they would allow the employee to perform work for a client of your business, provided that they didn't initially solicit the work. This law also provides for a civil penalty and it um, and it also provides a, a private cause of action for an employee who is subject to a non-compete agreement. They can bring a private cause of action against the employer and they can recover attorney's fees and costs. You also have to put a notice in your workplace, a posting of either a copy of the law or a summary of the law provided by the Department of Labor and Industry. They have not produced that summary yet. So as of now, it would be a copy of the law itself, but we still have a month to go or a month and a half to go. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay, the Virginia Human Rights Act. Uh, this law has been in existence for a while, but the General Assembly has greatly expanded it and amended it to include sexual orientation and gender identity as protected characteristics against which you cannot discriminate. That's the change that got the most publicity in the news. To my mind, that's actually the least significant change that they've made because I think a lot of businesses recognize that sexual orientation and gender identity could be framed as sex discrimination, which was already prohibited. 
This law goes into effect on July 1st, 2020. And in addition to adding those two protected characteristics, it has expanded the coverage for non-age-based discharge claims to employers with five or more employees. Previously, the law did not apply to businesses with more than 15 employees, but now it does. So now there's no limit on the number of employees you can have and still be subject to this law when it comes to non-age-based claims. Age-based claims are still limited to employers with between five and 20 employees. The law provides a, a private cause of action, and under this private cause of action, courts can award compensatory damages, punitive damages, and attorney's fees. This is going to be very significant for businesses in Virginia because previously you really only had to worry about Title VII lawsuits, and that's the federal law that prohibits discrimination. Title VII, however, has a cap on damages. This law has no cap on damages, unlimited damages. Um, another issue here is under Title VII, those lawsuits are brought in federal court. Federal court has summary judgment, which is where the defendant can say to the court, here are the undisputed facts, and based on these undisputed facts, we win. There's no point in having a trial, and the federal court can grant summary judgment, which means the employer can win without having to go before a jury, without having to go all the way to trial. In state court in Virginia, there really isn't summary judgment. There are a few limited exceptions to that, but for the most part, it's almost impossible to do summary judgment in most civil actions in Virginia. So this new law is going to be very expensive for employers to defend and very expensive if they lose. In addition to the private cause of action, the attorney general is also allowed to bring suit against a business for violating this law, and the court can impose civil penalties. Um, as you see, there are 50,000 for the first offense and 100,000 for the second offense, plus, of course, attorney's fees. Go to the next slide, please. There is a new law prohibiting pregnancy discrimination. Now, pregnancy discrimination was already illegal in Virginia, but it has been greatly expanded with this new law. So this new law um, prohibits discrimination based on, and this goes into effect on July 1. It prohibits discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. So that would include, um, say, lactation. And the law requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations to employees to allow them to perform their work. So it's a lot like the ADA in that regard. In addition, like the ADA, this law requires employers to engage in an interactive process with employees who are pregnant or have medical conditions related to childbirth or pregnancy. Employers will have to engage in the interactive process with any employee who requests an accommodation for those types of conditions in order to identify an accommodation that would allow the employee to continue working. This law creates a private cause of action for employees to bring. Um, there's no administrative exhaustion requirement and goes straight to court. The law also requires that employers provide notice to employees of both the prohibition against discrimination and of the employee's right to a reasonable accommodation. And you have to provide this notice a number of ways. You have to post a, a notice in conspicuous places. You have to include it in the handbook, your employee handbook. You have to give all your new hires a copy of this um, notice, even your males, your new male employees. You have to give them a copy of this notice. And anytime an employee tells you that she's pregnant, you have to give her a copy of the notice within 10 days of the announcement. So this is another major change for businesses in Virginia. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, there's also an, a law that um, a very, this didn't get much publicity, and I think the reason is the National Labor Relations Act already prohibited this type of restriction, but I still run across this occasionally when I review employer handbooks, and that would be any type of policy or, or practice an employer has of punishing employees or restricting employees from discussing their wages. And the National Labor Relations Act already prohibits employers from prohibiting employees discussing their wages. But the National Labor Relations Act only provides protection to employees who aren't supervisors. This law would apply to any employee, and this Virginia law prohibits 
employers from discharging or taking any other type of retaliation against an employee for discussing wages. So your employees are permitted to talk to each other, ask each other, how much do you make? How much does he make? And they can have those discussions in the workplace. And I know a lot of businesses are uncomfortable with that, but it is protected, as I mentioned, under the National Labor Relations Act for non-supervisory employees, but under this law for all your employees. The only exception would be what are commonly referred to as confidential employees. And those would be employees who have access to compensation information of other employees as part of their essential job functions. That's often your HR person or your payroll manager. Um, but even there, there are a few exceptions where you can't punish them. And that would be if they're making the disclosure in response to a formal complaint or charge, if they're making the disclosure in furtherance of an investigation, proceeding or hearing or action, um, or if they're making the disclosure consistent with a legal duty such as they're, they've been subpoenaed. You can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is um, a correction to an earlier law. This is a law that was passed last year that requires Virginia employers to basically provide a pay stub. So whenever you issue a paycheck, you also have to give employees a written statement um, showing the number of hours worked, the pay rate, the gross wages, and an itemization of deductions. The law as written last year which went into effect on January 1 of this year, required you to report hours for all your employees, including your FLSA exempt employees. And even as of yesterday, the last time I checked, the Department of Labor and Industries website still said we're going to begin enforcing this on July 1st for your exempt employees too. However, the General Assembly did pass a law that amended in, in the most recent session, um, and this was signed into uh, law recently by the governor, they have amended this requirement to eliminate the hour reporting requirement for your exempt employees. So you don't have to include hours worked on the pay stub for your exempt employees after all. And I did have an error about that in my the article that I published last week that I will be correcting today. So this is important to take note. You do not have to report hours for your exempt employees after all. They have changed that. But you do have to report hours for everyone else now. You can go to the next slide, please. So here are some items that the General Assembly considered and were widely discussed that we think will probably come back. And so you need to just kind of be on the lookout for this. I don't think these issues are dead. Um, the first is the repeal of the right to work law. Just so everyone understands, because the terms are often misused, right to work and employee at will are two different things. An employee at will means that the person, both the employee and the employer can terminate the employment relationship at any time for any or no reason. I hear a lot of people boasting that Virginia is an employee at employment at will state. Uh, newsflash, 49 states are employment at will states. That's really not something to brag about. That's not that big of a deal. What does make us um, more employee friend, employer friendly than some other states is that we are a right to work state. And what that means is that in Virginia and in other right to work states, no one can be compelled to join a union or pay union membership fees in order to have a job. That makes Virginia less attractive to union organizers because they can organize a workplace, have to represent those employees, incur all the costs in doing so, and have members of that bargaining unit that they're representing refuse to join and refuse to pay membership dues. For the, from the union's perspective, they're freeloaders. The union still owes them a duty of fair representation, so it still has to do a lot of work on their behalf, but they are not paying for it. They're not paying their union dues. But that's legal in Virginia, and in Virginia, you can't require those employees to pay union dues. That law has been under attack, and there were a number of attempts this year to try to overturn that law to revoke it, and that would have made Virginia um, much more susceptible to unionization efforts. That attempt failed this year. I wouldn't be surprised if it came back next year. There was a lot of support for it. And related to that was there was a proposal to allow what is in how you how you term this depends on which side of the debate you're on. If you favor unions, you're going to call it an employee fair share fee. And if you are against unions, you call it an agency fee. And essentially, this is a reduced union membership due where the employee just pays a portion of the member, union membership dues 
to the union if the employee doesn't want to join the union. So they're not compelled to join the union and pay the full membership due, dues, but if they choose not to, they have to pay this reduced fee, which again is either called an employee fair share fee or an agency fee. And that basically helps support the union for their exercise of the duty of fair representation without the employee having to join the union. Currently, these types of fees are not legal in Virginia, but there was there were a few attempts this year in the General Assembly to overturn that and allow those types of fees. Again, that did fail, but I wouldn't be surprised if it came back. There are also a number of attempts to introduce new paid sick leave requirements. Those didn't um, pass, but I wouldn't be surprised if they came back. There are also attempted legislation to restrict the use of arbitration. Those also failed. I again expect to see them back. A few words on that. Um, the, there have been other states that have passed laws prohibiting arbitration agreements and employment relationships in certain contexts, and those laws have failed. Um, the courts, the, the laws passed and were enacted, but courts have struck them down as being inconsistent with the Federal Arbitration Act. And we've seen that happen in California and New York. The Virginia attempt on this was going to prohibit um, public contracting if employers with, with businesses that had employment arbitration clauses. Again, that did fail. We expect to see similar attempts in the future, though. You can go to the next slide, please. So th this is my final slide, really, and these are just action items for businesses in light of these new changes to Virginia law, which I think it's impossible to understate the significance of these changes because it's so radically different from what we've had in Virginia. There are a number of steps that you need to take now before these laws go into effect. Um, first and foremost, I do think that you should give some consideration to whether arbitration agreements with your employees would be a good idea for your business. It, they're not a good idea for every business. They work for some businesses and not for all. There are a lot of pros and cons to having arbitration agreements. You really need to consult legal counsel to see if it's the right fit for your business. But if you um, are able to take advantage of this, if arbitration agreements would work, it would at least get these disputes out of court. And um, that can help reduce your, your legal fees for these types of disputes. And it can also avoid the risk of a runaway jury because you're getting rid of the jury trial. Um, again, they don't work for all businesses. For some businesses, it would be a bad idea, but it is something to look into and at least evaluate and consider whether it would make sense for your business. Um, you do need to go ahead and revise your employee handbook. You have to make sure that your anti-discrimination clause addresses sexual orientation, gender identity, and pregnancy and pregnancy-related issues. You have to make sure that your handbook includes a reasonable accommodation um, process for pregnancy and pregnancy related issues. You want to take a look at any employment agreements that you currently have that have non-compete or other post-employment restrictive covenants to make sure that they don't run afoul of the new law prohibiting certain non-compete agreements. Certainly any such agreements you have with anyone making less than $59,000 a year. If you have any independent contractor relationships, you need to take a very close look at those and consult with legal counsel to make sure that they would ups, they would stand up under this new um, standard that the General Assembly has imposed. You're going to want to train your employees on discrimination, the new discrimination rules, and also train them on timekeeping because of the new law that would allow your employees to sue for non-payment of wages. You need to make sure you have in place very good timekeeping policies so that you're capturing all compensable time and you're compensating employees for all compensable time. It's not unusual for a business to have good policies on timekeeping, but no one's trained the supervisors on those policies and no one's making sure they're actually being followed. And so you'll have supervisors who will tell the employees, work through your lunch period or take care of that task before you clock in things of that nature that, that could expose your business to great liability if you're not watching. So you need to make sure your employees and your supervisors are trained on all that. You also want to go ahead and post the notices that are required for the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act paid leave. You have to post a notice about the non-compete agreement prohibition and post a notice about pregnancy discrimination. And of course, you want to go ahead and start budgeting for these minimum wage increases that will be here next year. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so now it's time for questions. I'm going to go to the question pane and see what we have. 
like we have a few. Um, first question I have here is whether if you are taking temperatures, do you have to do it in a private location? You do have to try to maintain employee privacy. I think it would be possible to do it without moving it to a private location by simply having enough spacing and making sure that the person who is taking the temperature has been trained on being discreet and not loudly announcing you know, in a loud voice what the temperature reading is. But you do want to take some steps to try to protect employee privacy with that. Um, doing it in a separate location, a private location, like a separate room would be a great idea if that's feasible for your business, but I don't think it's absolutely required. Um, let's see, next question I have here. Um, will an employer's PPP loan forgiveness be impacted if a full-time employee resigns without notice? Um, you know, that's something I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer in this presentation. Um, we can look into that for you, though, and get back to you. Um, okay, some of these questions are somewhat duplicative, so I'm just reading through them to see if there are any new ones. Okay, here's a good one. Um, an employee has refused to return to work but has been working from home. Can you still terminate the employee if he refuses to return to the office? Telework is the employer's discretion. If the employer decides that the work should be performed in the office, even though you were allowing it to be performed remotely, but you've now decided it should be performed in the office, you can enforce that requirement and make the employee come into work. Um, let's see. If an employee was tested but tested negative, can they claim emergency sick leave? Um, so the emergency paid sick leave would not apply for someone who has um, tested negative unless they were directed by a healthcare provider to self-isolate, which is very possible because my understanding is that with a negative test, that isn't conclusive. So it would really, the, the fact that they've been tested and the test results really wouldn't impact whether they qualify for the emergency paid sick leave. It would just depend on whether they were under doctor's um, orders to self-isolate. See. Okay. Um, how should we handle a situation where the employee signed the offer, returned to work on the scheduled day, and communicated on the next scheduled day that someone in their household is presenting symptoms, and they're concerned about their own pre-existing health issue and are uncomfortable with returning to work? So if they just have someone in their household that's presenting symptoms, there's currently no guidance that would suggest you have to treat that as an exposure. I recognize that that's logically inconsistent, but unless they know that the person has COVID-19, the CDC guidance would not consider that um, an employee having been exposed to COVID-19. So there isn't anything you would have to do with, with that employee. Under these facts that you have in this question, you could still require the employee to continue working. Um, if they're uncomfortable with returning to work because of their own pre-existing health issue, I would ask them to present some documentation from their doctor saying that they can't work right now. And if they're unable to do that, you can tell them they have to come in or they'll be terminated. They might have a doctor um, who will provide documentation that they do have a disability such as asthma and that as a result of that, they need a reasonable accommodation of a leave of absence during this crisis. And that's something you'll just have to evaluate on a case by case basis, but they could potentially have protection under the ADA. Um, let's see, uh, next question I have here is, are there any guidelines on workers' comp claims from employees working remotely? I'm not aware of any guidelines. I do know that workers' comp does apply to employees who are working remotely, but I'm not aware of any published guidelines that address procedures you have to take. Okay, um, do employees have legal protections if the reason they don't want to return to work is due to living with someone who is high risk, not infected, and they don't want to return to work because they live with a high risk person? Um, generally speaking, probably not. Uh, the fact that they live with someone who is high risk would not entitle them to a reasonable accommodation. The duty to accommodate would be for the person with a disability, not for someone who is associated with a person with, with a disability. The ADA does prohibit discrimination against an employee because the employee is associated with someone who has a disability, but it does not require a reasonable accommodation 
for someone who is just associated with a person with a disability. Um, let's see, let's go to this next one. Oh, I thought, sorry about that. Um, when an employee at an essential business takes off saying that he has been exposed to COVID, should we require a doctor's note before paying her to be sure we are reimbursed and to be sure she is not just taking advantage? So this really goes to the emergency paid sick leave. Um, and I do recommend that you ask for some documentation from the doctor and they should be able to get that. If they're saying that they've been exposed and that they've been advised by a doctor to self-isolate, I would ask for some type of written documentation and it's really to make sure you're able to get that tax credit. The regulations don't specifically say that, but I think that would be a real potential for abuse. So I would recommend asking for a doctor's note for that. Um, the next question is exemptions for public sector employees for any of these new Virginia employment laws. Generally speaking, no, there are no exemptions, um, but it, some of the individual laws may have some um, leeway for public sector employees, but generally speaking, these laws were drafted to include all businesses, including public sector employers. Okay, next question. Um, regarding equipment sharing, any advice for employees working in a kitchen where sharing equipment is necessary, physical distancing is impossible, and the work is fast paced? That is going to be a real huge challenge. And what I would recommend that you do, and I have not read these very closely myself, is take a look at the CDC guidance that has been issued with regard to meat packing um, meat or meat processing facilities. I think that would be the most analogous where you do have people who are in a fast paced environment and do have to share equipment and physical distancing is difficult. So take a look at the guidance that the CDC has issued for that, but that's going to be a huge challenge I think for a lot of businesses. Okay. Next question, we have a new employee that works for us part time. We're using PPP and care stimulus funding to maintain average income. We found out she's collecting unemployment from a past employer. Do we need to report? That's an interesting one. I have not run into that. Um, I think I would report that. Um, I'm not aware of any prohibition that would prevent you from reporting that, but I think I would be inclined to report that. But I'm also not aware of any requirement that you do so. Oh, this is a good one. Um, this question is about unpaid internships. Do so they have to be paid? Unpaid internships are a very difficult proposition for for-profit employers. If you're a non-profit employer, it's a little bit different. But for for-profit businesses, it's very difficult to have a legal unpaid internship. The rules regarding unpaid inter internships for for-profit businesses essentially require that the person provide no service whatsoever and their presence is actually an impediment to your work. So I would strongly recommend that you take a close look at anyone you're not paying in an internship. Um, it's probably not going to be legal um, as is. And yes, they would have a cause of action under these new laws. Uh, here we have a procedural question from David Campbell. Hi, David. Uh, could employers legal counsel make a motion transferring jurisdiction of a discrimination claim from the state to the federal EEOC? Um, with regard to the administrative process, no, not really. It's going to be processed by either the Virginia Human's right, Human Rights Commission or the EEOC, and it's really up to them as to which one will process it. With regard to court, once the case is in court, there is a process called removal where you can sometimes remove a case to federal court, but if they're suing based on a state law, you might be stuck in state court. Um, okay, question about independent contractors. Are there forms or paperwork we can get from an independent contractor to help prove that they are an independent contractor? Um, there are a few things you can do to help um, bolster your argument that they are an independent contractor. Certainly, if they have their own business license, that's going to help. If they have their own employer identification number, you know, the, the, you're not just paying them based on their social security number, but they have an EIN, that's going to help. If they have a registered business name, if they um, have created you know, an LLC, that will help. You can also have a written independent contractor agreement with them. But none of that is going to control if the facts of the case point to an employment relationship. 
instead of an independent contractor relationship. Those are just things that can kind of help, but ultimately it's going to depend on the actual facts. Um, Jessica has a question regarding non-compete agreements. We typically, typically require a non-compete for a limited amount of time in return for paid training. Is this still legal? No, not if the person is making less than $59,000 a year. They're just banned now. You can't do that at all now. Question about um, religious employers. Um, does this apply to private employers of the BFOQ for religion? And I'm guessing that that is a question about the new prohibition on discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation. I'm guessing that's what the this is there. Um, the law does not specifically address religious employers. It would depend on what type of position the employee occupies. Um, there has been a long-standing exception for uh, what's called the, it's called the ministerial exception. So essentially this is why a church can decide they're only going to have male pastors, for example. That's clearly sex discrimination, but it's legal because of the ministerial exception. And that's essentially the government saying we're not going to intrude upon a church's decisions about who can be a minister. So certainly if a church had a, um, a rule that they didn't, they didn't want gay pastors, for example, or gay priests, that would still be legal. Um, and there would be an exception, but with regard to non-ministerial employers um, of a religious business, there's currently no exception under this law, but that, I'm sure that will be an issue to be litigated. Uh, next question is, are employees, and I know we're past the hour, so if you need to sign off, folks, I understand, um, but I'm going to keep on answering the questions, and I have another 10 to go through. Um, as long as there's anyone left on the line. <laughs> so if you want to hear the answer to all the questions, you can just hang on. Is an employee eligible for emergency sick leave multiple times? They only get the um, 10 days of emergency paid sick leave. If they only use a couple days for their first absence, then they would have the remaining days left, but they only get that one, um, the one set of 10 days. They can take it in, in breaks though. Um, Here's an elaboration. Does the expansion of the protected class to include sexual orientation and gender identity apply to private employers with a bona fide occupational qualification for religion? Again, there's currently no exception in the law for that. I think that that's going to be um, an issue that we will probably see litigation on. I think what you're talking about is kind of like the cake decorator issue that we saw out in Colorado a few years ago. So. If a private business says, I have a religious objection to um, sexual orientation and gender identity issues, would the private business be compelled to comply with the law? Most likely, yes. But again, that's something we're going to have to wait to see litigation on. Let's see. Um, can an employee in a protected class, such as age, be laid off for lack of work related to the job position? For example, a caterer planner has no work post COVID-19 for at least the unforeseeable future. Absolutely, as long as you're not being discriminatory in how you are selecting people for layoff, you can definitely lay off people for lack of work. Um, let's see. Accrued PTO is still not considered wages in Virginia, correct? That is correct. Therefore, we are not obligated to pay out accrued PTO. Yes, that is correct for now. Um, that is absolutely correct. The way it works in Virginia, unlike other states, is vacation or paid time off is not considered wages unless you have a practice or policy of treating them as wages. So if, if you have a practice or policy of paying out accrued PTO or vacation when someone terminates employment, then it would be considered wages, but otherwise it's not. Um, is there a poster already created for the pregnancy discrimination? Uh, not yet to my knowledge, um, but I think you got to keep checking back on that. With regard to COVID-19 and a company's liability, what are your thoughts on summer interns? We typically have two college-age students and one recent high school grad. Should we eliminate or have them sign a waiver? Um, you might want to take a look into having to eliminating your internship programs. I know a lot of businesses are eliminating internship programs this summer. 
because of the risk of COVID, um, another option would be to bring them in and just treat them as you are your other employees in terms of the restrictions. You might need to limit the number of interns you have. Waivers. I've seen a lot of debate about these. I recommend against having your employees sign any type of waiver. First, it's not going to be enforced. Secondly, it's almost an admission that you're not providing a safe workplace to your employees. I, I think they're just a very bad idea, but clearly they're not going to be enforceable to have someone sign a waiver saying that they're not going to sue you or claim workers comp for any exposure to, to COVID-19 in the workplace that would um, not be enforceable and might violate some rules. So I do not recommend you have employees or interns sign any type of waiver. Um, this question is, should an employer keep a log of daily staff temperatures and symptom screening? Yes, that's probably a good idea to keep that log. Um, of course, you want to maintain confidentiality. And as I mentioned earlier, whichever employee you have taking care of this issue for you, make sure that he or she understands that importance of confidentiality. You don't want to um, put the office gossip in charge of that. Uh, we have a few employees who would probably be considered vulnerable. We've asked that they disclose, self-disclose and telework if they do not want to come in. Is that enough? I don't, you, you don't even need to do that. Um, what you want to avoid is treating any of your employees differently based on your percep perception that, there are, that they are vulnerable. For example, if they're um, older employees or if you know they have pre-existing health conditions, you should not be making any of those determinations and you should not be um, treating them differently or have them work differently. If the employee comes to you and says, I need an accommodation because I have this vulnerability, I'm I'm of a certain age or I have asthma or some other pre-existing health condition or I have a compromised immune system. If that happens, then what you need to do is ask the employee to provide you with medical documentation from their doctor to support their need for an accommodation. Um, Next question, if we offer a furloughed employee to come back to work and they decline, does that open up needing to offer emergency sick leave or emergency FEMLA? Or since they declined, are they still considered furloughed and we don't have to extend emergency leave? If you have an offer to work and they are declining to come back, you do not need to offer them emergency leave or emergency FEMLA, they're not employed. So leave paid leave is leave from work and if they're not in a leave status then no they wouldn't get that so you would um, probably just consider them to still be furloughed Let's see if an employee is running a fever and we ask them to stay home but it turns out that they only had a sinus infection or something else can we still pay them the emergency sick pay since we told them to stay home and be fever free for 72 hours? We were concerned it could be COVID. Well, the emergency paid sick leave is not available simply because the employer told the employee to go home. You should not be giving the employee emergency paid sick leave based on the employer's direction to stay home. That would not be covered by emergency paid sick leave and you wouldn't get a tax credit for that. You only get a tax credit if it's a doctor or healthcare provider who's directed them to self-isolate. Uh, I think this is duplicative. Any forms or paperwork we can get from IC? I've already done that one. That's duplicative. Uh, let's see. For FFCRA, we are allowing partial telework and partial child care. So is the 10 weeks or 400 hours worth of benefits until December? Um, so with regard to the um, Families First Coronavirus Act paid leave requirements, you are allowed if you choose, you do not have to, but if the employer chooses, the employer can allow the employee to take those paid leave benefits on an intermittent basis. And if so, it will stretch out the paid leave period from beyond 10 weeks to however long um, you've allowed them to do the intermittent leave. But regardless of how long you've let them stretched out, it's still going to expire at the end of this year. So it does go through December 31st. Okay, um, just heard the 10 emergency paid sick leave. Where is this info rules found? Um, I think that's a question about the number of days for emergency paid sick leave. 
If you um, Google Department of Labor Families First Coronavirus Response Act, they have a whole web page with a number of questions and answers about the rule, and they have a few other web pages about the Family First Coronavirus Emergency Response, um, the Emergency Paid Sick Leave. So go to the Department of Labor's website for that. Let's see. If an employee resigns due to the worry of getting COVID, are they eligible for unemployment? Probably not. Um, it would be a resignation, and typically you're not going to get unemployment if you've resigned. Employers that are exempt from FFCRA, how would you recommend communication of the exemption? Um, you could just tell your employees, you could post a notice about it, or you could um, include in your coronavirus policy that you're distributing to your employees a statement about how their absences will be treated, and you could include in that a statement that your business is exempt from FFCRA, either because you have too many employees or you fit under that narrow exception for small businesses that you've made a determination it would threaten the businesses um, existence to provide that leave, but you could put that in your coronavirus response plan or your coronavirus policy that you're going to distribute to your employees. Let's see. What if we are a healthcare provider office and an employee has a fever and we send them home in case, then will we get the tax credit for paid leave? I think that question goes to the fact that there is an exemption for Families First Coronavirus Response Act for healthcare provider employees. And that's optional though. So the employer who has healthcare provider employees or um, is able to take ex advantage of that exemption does not have to take advantage of that exemption. So if you want to have the paid leave under Families First Coronavirus Act and you have healthcare providers, um, you just don't don't claim the exemption, you can go ahead and provide them with the paid leave. But in this question, the employee has a fever and you sent them home in case Again, that's not going to qualify for emergency paid sick leave. The fact that the employer has sent them home, you need to have the employee's health care provider take a look at the employee and recommend that the employee stay home to get the emergency paid sick leave. An employee who refuses to come back to work due to their child's school being closed, how is that handled? Um, so it depends on where they are in the employment relationship when they refuse to come back to work. So if they have been fired, like if you did a layoff and you actually terminate their employment and now you're offering to rehire them and they say, I can't, my kid's out of school, they don't have any rights to paid leave at that point. If um, they have not been fired, if they say, for example, are furloughed or they're currently employed and they say, I can't come to work because my kid is out of school, then they would fall under the emergency FEMLA, which provides for paid leave for employees who can't work or telework because their child's school has been closed. Okay. And the last question, and then we'll close it out. If someone is improperly paid, i.e. considered exempt or non-exempt, and then the employer corrects, will that still bring um, penalties? The law has not addressed that. The Virginia law has not addressed um, any type of window of correction for employers. I would recommend that you try to correct it as um, quickly as you can because if you don't owe them any more money, if you've already paid them everything um, because you recognize the mistake and you've corrected it, they shouldn't have any claim against your company. So it still makes sense to correct the mistake as quickly as possible. Okay, so that's um, all the questions and it is uh, 18 minutes past the hour. So I appreciate your patience, everyone who is still on the line. Thank you very much. And if you have um, any other legal needs or questions, you're welcome to reach out to us. So thanks a lot, everybody. Bye.